The summer of 2023 confirmed what we've been telling you all along, that the future for the Cincinnati Reds is so bright, we need sunglasses. You are Locked On Reds, your daily Cincinnati Reds podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked on Reds, your daily source for all things Cincinnati Reds. I'm Stephen Offenbaker, and he's Jeff Carr with his Ellie De La Cruz shades. And we love baseball. We love these Cincinnati Reds. We've taken that love of the game, and we have turned it into information for you. Locked on Reds is part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. On today's podcast, we are going to be talking about when everything began to change in 2023. That's June baseball in Cincinnati. We're going to take a look back at who was hot, who led the way, and who might not have gotten enough credit for what they did during that part of the season. Before we get into any of that, I want to shout out the sponsor of today's podcast, Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the promo code Locked On MLB for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Uh, you know what else was guaranteed, Jeff? That was exciting baseball in the month of June in Cincinnati. Uh, I was in town for the beginning of that. You and I had some adventures down at Great American Ballpark. We got to see a couple of really cool things there at the beginning of the season, and it was really a springboard. It carried over all of the things that started happening there in May, where we talked about Matt McClain coming up and the energy changing and everybody kind of coming along for that ride. And then June happened, and this team just skyrocketed. Yeah, and it was funny because that month as a whole was really a roller coaster when you look back on it. Because in my mind, I think of June of 2023. I do think of that 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 was kind of the culmination of everything we've been saying. We've been telling everybody, look for 2024. And as much as we were really excited that they could have made the playoffs this year, that's what everybody has been looking forward to is 2024. June was kind of the jumping off point to that. We are going to look back on June of 2023 and say that is when everything was set up. But it's funny because I don't remember this, but looking back on it, the month actually started with four straight losses. They got out of Boston with a loss, then they got swept by the Brewers. And once again, and we asked the question when we were talking about Matt McClain, was that move born out of, yes, this is the move the Reds need to win, or we're just really hoping anything works at this point. They started doing it again because after that four game losing streak, Andrew Abbott gets called up on June 5th. You and I were in attendance. Ellie De La Cruz gets called That's up and makes his debut. And, and he makes his debut on June 6th. We were in attendance. And then June 7th, you had that Will Benson walk-off that, that that's going to be a thing in and of itself. When you look back and you think on some of the moments of 2023, you, you say the Will Benson walk-off, and you can picture him slamming the bat down, just pumped up, screaming back at the Reds' dugout, so fired up. That was really when everything just blew up and, and and went crazy. You know, that that week, that week, you're absolutely right. I remember the losing streak because we were at a bunch of those games. And mm. then Andrew Abbott comes up, and I was excited to be in the ballpark for that. But then, you know, I actually left town the next morning and yep. headed up to Springfield. I was getting ready to start uh, getting things wrapped up to come back home. And then uh, as I'm driving into Springfield, I get texts from you and uh, our buddy Dave Pemberton. Like, they called him up. We're going to the game. Come back. And I yeah. whipped it around and came back. And I'm so glad that I did because, you know, we can look at the month of June, but I think we can specifically look at June 6th, the Ellie De La Cruz call-up game, when all of Cincinnati – bought in the 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 energy that was in great american ballpark that day you know i've said this before jeff i've never experienced anything like that during a regular season reds game i've never felt the stadium feel like it did that night and with so many people there and that energy i think that also is what brought a lot of people back to this team up until that point we still had a lot of people saying i'm not coming back as long as there's a castellini i'm not coming back until they do something i'm not coming back there was a lot of that and a lot of that started to go away starting on june 6th and that energy surrounding ellie de la cruz 
I skimmed back through and I was looking at our episodes from back then to kind of like get a feel for what we were saying and, and what was going on and how we were perceiving it. And I had mentioned because I was walking around the concourse because the day he debuted was actually a three, two, one Tuesday. And I was going to go get a refill. And I just remember that, you know, Joe Zara Houston announced Will Ellie De La Cruz coming up to the bat and everyone on the concourse immediately like tried to find a spot for themselves to watch it wherever they were standing on the concourse. It was almost as if, and everyone would stop and watch. It was almost as if like it was the national anthem or something like they were paying that much attention to him on his first night. And of course he doubles, he has a couple of walks. Then his next game, he hits his first career home run, both games overshadowed by the fact that they were walked off. His first game was Matt McClain walk off. His second game was Will Benson's walk off. And it was just such a magnificent time. And it really sparked because then they lose back-to-back games. They lose one to the Dodgers, one to the Cardinals. And then they go on the 12 game winning streak that sees all manner of shenanigans, including, and, and, and I said, I wanted to talk about this and we are definitely going to be talking about it later on um, in more detail, but including the Ricky Karcher game, including Ooh. so many amazing, like Joey Votto coming back and home re on his first game. There was so many memories just in the month of June and how everything changed for this team. Think about this, Steve, on June 10th, when they went into the ballpark right before their 12 game winning streak started, they were four games out of first place. And at the end of that winning streak, there were a game and a half ahead in first place. That was such a wild ride within the month that was June and the just euphoric feeling that for once we haven't had a euphoric feeling about baseball in a long time in Cincinnati. And June brought that. No, it, and it you know, it's funny because we always have this debate. Is Cincinnati still a baseball town? Is Cincinnati a Bengals town now? Like what, what kind of town is this? And that energy that started on the sixth with Ellie's call up and then the 12 game winning streak, we were very quickly reminded that Cincinnati was, is, and probably always will be baseball first because the, the town gobbled that up as soon as the Reds showed them a little bit of something. And I think that that energy from the fans, and we've heard players talk about this, uh, players on this team talk about this, that they fed off of that energy. And it, it became this reciprocal relationship between the players and the fans. And that component has been missing for a long, long time in Cincinnati. And and these June performances, this, this, uh, this success from all of these young, talented players, uh, I think really fueled the return to the love of the game for the fans in Cincinnati. I just got chills thinking about that, that Atlanta game, the very first game of that series, when there was like 40,000 screaming fans there. And that was the game that they won, the only game against the Braves that they won at, at that season. But such a phenomenal phenomenal streak and i i really feel like and i'm not saying that they're never going to lose a game next season but i really feel like we're going to feel a lot more games like that next year than the games that we saw in april you know like the lowest attending game in great american ballpark history and things like that june is what is more the feeling that we're going to get as the future rolls along because june really set the reds on track for the bright future that we have been hoping for and that we've been saying over the last couple of years. But you know, with all this amazingness, we have to we have to boil it down because what is sports without arguing about things? So what was the best development of the month of June? We're going to argue about that coming up next. Before we do that, though, I want to tell you about one of today's sponsors, and that is FanDuel. FanDuel's got so many amazing offers for you when it comes to promotions and things like that. And with October baseball just rolling on, we got Game 7 in the NLCS. We had Game 7 in the ALCS last night. We got the World Series just around the corner. Now is the best time to get on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Join FanDuel today. And you could get $200 in bonus bets after your first $5 wager. Whether you win or lose, you're guaranteed that $200 in bonus bets. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and create your new account. Then you can get in on the action from first pitch to the final out. You can take prop bets, money lines, over-unders, all that great stuff. Uh, and if you don't want to wait for the game to end, they've got amazing live bets and quick bets and things like that. Bets on the next at-bat even. 
game seven. I already said it. Game seven. Two of the best words in the English language when you put them together. The over-under for the Phillies and the Diamondbacks tonight is eight and a half, Steve. I don't know. I know we got some pitchers on the mound I here, know. but uh, there's always those there's always those game seven shenanigans that make me wonder if yeah. they'll get that high because game sevens is when you see starting pitchers coming out of the bullpen and you see all kinds of things that you don't get to see all season long. And, and I'm there for it. So I, I don't know how I would take that bet. You know, FanDuel, FanDuel makes it easy, but in this regard, I don't know which direction to go. I think you know what I'm going to say. I know what take, it is. Take the, the over. over. And you can put $5 on that over. And you're going to get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed, whether I'm right or wrong. So check it out today. It's fanduel.com slash locked on. Sign up today. New users get that $200 bonus bets back after the first $5 wager. You can make every moment more with FanDuel, official sports betting partner, Major League Baseball. And thanks as always for making Locked On Reds your first listen of the day. And if you're watching here on YouTube, click that like button. We really like it when you click the like button. Give us the thumbs up there and click that subscribe button and the bell and all that good stuff to get notified because we're going to be with you here every single day talking Reds baseball all throughout the offseason as we get ready for what's going to be an electric 2024. And speaking of every day, coming up tomorrow, we are going to look at the stretch run that ultimately didn't breed a playoff appearance, but we're going to look at what the 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 experience that the Reds got that's going to help them for the future. But Steve, I want to look at the biggest developments of June and July because this stretch run for the Reds was so pivotal that there were so many different performances to shout out. It's really hard to just pick one. It is. As a matter of fact, while we were prepping for this, I kept looking at numbers going, did you know that this guy did this thing? And did you know that that guy, I mean, it kept, it Confirmed. kept surprising me because some of the, some of the numbers were pretty astronomical. And, and in the moment, I think we, it was easy for us to overlook what some players were doing. And we're going to get into that coming up in the next segment. Uh, we were so you know, captivated by Ellie De La Cruz stealing all the way around the bases and going home or hitting for the cycle or what Matt McClain was doing that we overlooked a couple other guys that really were kind of driving the ship of the offense, you know, quietly in the background. Yeah. And I really think it's, it's hard to distinguish between these two dudes because their performances at the plate and in the field were so amazing, but between Matt McClain and Will Benson, the offense went like as much as Ellie De La Cruz was so much fun to watch and the different things that he did, like Will Benson, and 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 we marveled over this uh, in, in prep. But for the months of June and July, when you put these two months together, he played forty six games. Will Benson did. He had a three thirteen batting average, a four twenty five on base percentage, and he slugged six oh nine in two months. This was the guy that everybody was like, oh my goodness, he's a waste of a roster space because he went one for 42 in the months of April and May. And then he comes back and he says, boom. And that walk-off home run that he just slammed his bat into the ground was kind of his way of just saying, what now? I got this. It was this part of the season where your little one-man pumper car started to really get overcrowded for the Will Benson fan club because you know it, it was your it was your uh, Jeff Carr was right and everybody else was wrong moment and I and I give that to you because Will Benson ended up being the guy you thought he was and it, and it looked shaky there for a minute but you never lost faith I give you a lot of credit for that and, and Will Benson delivered and got things done the month of June for me. Um, you know, I've been trying to figure out who was going to be my next favorite player. Uh, my favorite player was Barry Larkin growing up. And then that turned into being Joey Votto. Uh, a lot of similarities. I played first base. I wore number 19. He plays first base. He wore number 19. Joey Votto was my guy. But, you know, we started to see the writing on the wall several years back. His time was running out. So I've been in the market for my next favorite player. And June of 2023 is when my next favorite player established himself. And that was Matt McClain. In his first full month uh, in the big leagues, he hit 287, 333, 548. But some of his other numbers, you know, you can look at his slash line and be like, wow, that's pretty good. But 19 RBIs in the month of June, five home runs 
in the month of June. And it's not just home runs, Jeff. He had four triples and seven doubles that month. He was smacking the ball all over the ballpark. And it didn't take long for me to look forward to every single one of his at-bats. He's just gritty. He's scrappy. He's that blue-collar Cincinnati guy that we all love to have around. And a lot of times those dudes are are decent, but they're not all-star caliber players. Matt McClain is an all-star caliber player that is going to be doing this for a long, long time. And, and that month really just cemented for me that, that he's my next favorite player for the Cincinnati Reds. I watch Trey Turner in the playoffs. I watch Corey Seager in the playoffs for the Rangers. I watch these shortstops, and I, and I think Matt McClain's going to be that guy. Matt yep. McClain's got the talent to be that guy, and he has shown it. I, I, I really think that he stays healthy. He continues to get better. We are going to be talking about Matt McClain as one of the best shortstops or best second baseman, wherever he ends up playing for the next you know five, six, seven years uh, for a while because of all of the talent that he brings to the ball field. And he really, according to fan graphs, he led the team in war largely because he just did everything. It wasn't necessarily because of one thing. And and while Will Benson paced the bats, Matt McClain, because of the defense that he brought along with his bat, was able to lead everybody in everything overall for that game. And it was so fantastic to see. The other development, of course, was on the pitching side of things, Andrew Ace Abbott. And I said it, Ace. The, those 11 starts, his first yeah. 11 starts of his career, 2.35 ERA. He had more than a strikeout per inning, needed to cut back on the walks a little bit, but overall a fantastic start. And nobody was near him as far as the wins above replacement statistic go for these two months for the Reds on the mound. You know, the thing with him is of all the pitchers they called up when he came up, there just really wasn't a lot of hype around him. I mean, he had done fine in the minor leagues, but you know, this is not one of those when, when Hunter green was coming, everyone lost their mind. When Nick Lodolo was coming, everyone lost their mind. When Abbott came up, everybody was like, ah, eh, you know, they do need a starter. I hope he does. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and then he was just absolutely lights out. And you know, meanwhile, he's having these starts and they're interviewing his dad every day. And that was probably my favorite part was every day, Jim day, checking it, checking in with Abbott's dad and yeah. Abbott's dad saying, no, he's not there yet. This isn't even his best stuff. He's, he's not pitching the way he normally does. And then when he figured it out and got the walks under control, there was even like a next level there. And, and it was just, it was really exciting to watch in a time where there wasn't a lot of exciting starting pitching to watch. And he is so different from, uh, green and Lodolo and those guys, because those guys got stuff. This dude just pitches. He's just got a mind for the mound and he's able to out think opponents and out strategize them and kind of hit his spots and, and just really dissect and at bat to the point that the other hitter has no idea what's coming because he's got such a pitch arsenal that he can call upon his changeup is nasty. His breaking stuff's nasty. His, he can locate his fastball And it's amazing to watch him work. He is such a treat to watch pitch. And I really hope that, you know, I mean, fatigue really settled in on him late in the season, but this was where he established himself. What was it? It was like 18 or 19 scoreless innings to begin his career. Like we were starting to wonder if he was ever going to give up a run. (laughs) Right. Like, I mean, he fit so well, the just fire that this team had at that time. And it was so much fun to see. I don't know. Like picking between those three things is so hard for me. I think probably, but there's one more guy that we didn't really dig in. We talked about Ellie's debut, but we really didn't talk about what he did for the entire month of June. Now I know ultimately he slumped a few times and his numbers didn't finish where we really had wanted or had hoped. And I still believe he's going to figure it out. But for the month of June, he started 21 games. Jeff, his slash line was 307, 358, 523. His OPS was 881. During that stretch, he hit three home runs, six doubles, two triples, and led the team in stolen bases for the month with nine while only getting caught one time. Also, you can throw in seven walks to kind of round that out. He had a great first month in the big leagues. I firmly believe he adds like, you know, pitch recognition, a little bit better pitch recognition, a little bit better plate discipline. You're talking about 
the guy that we expect him to be. It's just, he got to the point where he was getting a little aggressive and, and pitchers understood like if they pitch him backwards, they got him. And then like at the time that he got used to them, pitching him backwards, they adjusted at the perfect time and started throwing fastballs early in the count when he was expecting breaking ball. So you, you saw like, he's got to learn to adjust, but I think that he's going to do that because he adjusted because his last month started to look a little bit more like his first couple of weeks in the big leagues, but you're right that month of June. I mean, that, that produced the legend that we had that if you get the man on base, good luck getting him out. Cause you ain't going to do it unless like you get a double play that the ball like skips right to the second baseman as his foot is on the bag. Yeah, we saw him do things that month, like leg out infield singles to the first baseman. We saw him do things that month that included rope doping uh, infielders to pick up an extra base. Uh, you know, he 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 did so many amazing disruptive things on the base path. And I think you're right. The pitch recognition is the next key development phase of his game. If he can come back in 2024 and be able to recognize pitches a little bit better and, and force pitchers to pitch him a little bit more true he's just going to be a nightmare. Yeah. And with all that being said, all these, these amazing moments, it's really hard to pick one. I, I'd love to hear from you guys in the comments section. What's your favorite development between these four guys were in that month. There was plenty of unsung heroes too. There were, there are a few guys on this team that had amazing runs during June and July, and we didn't talk about them uh, this segment, but we're going to rectify that because they didn't get the credit that they deserved when it was actually happening. So coming up, we're going to talk about these unsung heroes of the summer. Uh, before I get into that, though, I want to talk about the unsung hero that can get you into the ballpark cheaply, and that is game time. You can take the guesswork out of buying tickets with the game time app. This is one of those things that Jeff and I both use. We both uh, make mo a lot of our, if not all of our game ticket purchases using this app because it's just so easy to use. It shows you a total cost right there before you click any purchase button so you know exactly what you're gonna spend and you get great deals on last minute tickets. Jeff and I did this every time we headed downtown to watch a Reds game, we would go grab some tacos, wander around the Dora, and when it was getting close to time to head into the old ballpark, we'd jump on the app, scoop up a couple tickets, greatly discounted, and, and then enjoy the the game and you can enjoy the game if you haven't used this app you can enjoy the game cheaply and get an additional twenty dollars off because if you download the game time app and create yourself an account use the promo code locked on mlb and on top of those cheap prices they're going to give you an additional twenty dollars off your first purchase that's almost getting to go to the game for free so Head over to the Game Time app right now. Download it from the App Store or the Google Play Store. Create that account on the Game Time app. Use the promo code Locked On MLB for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms do apply. Create your account and redeem the code Locked On MLB today. Twenty dollars off. Last minute tickets, lowest prices, guaranteed. You can follow us in between episodes on all of the social medias. Make sure you head over to at Jeff Carr, Jeff with three F's on TikTok. Because next season, if Jeff Carr has 1,000 followers on his TikTok, he will be leading a flash mob through the concourse of Great American Ballpark doing a fry box dance that he will invent. Uh, we don't want to miss that. It will live in infamy. It'll get gifed. It'll go viral. A lot of things are going to happen. So make sure you head over there and do that. You can also follow us on X, Twitter, whatever we're calling it. Uh, you can follow Jeff at Jeff Carr. That's Jeff with three Fs. You can follow me at S Offenbaker. That's with two Fs. And you can follow the show at Locked on Reds. There's no Fs in that. Also, join us over on our Discord server. There's a great community of people over there talking baseball. Uh, we've got a Bengal side channel if you want to talk a little football. We've got a gaming side channel. We've got all kinds of stuff. There's a little something for everybody on the Discord server. If you want to head over there, the link is down in today's show description. All right, Jeff. We talked about this a little bit in show prep and, and discovered that there were a couple unsung heroes that probably didn't get the credit that they deserved uh, no. while it was happening during June and July. We were so fixated on the Matt McLeans and the Andrew Abbott's and the Ellie De La Cruz's uh, that there were some guys kind of quietly carrying this team on their back while everybody else figured out who they were going to be at the big league level. And let's just start the conversation with unsung hero. Number one, the Viking himself, Jake Fraley. 
Absolutely. Because if you look at his numbers, especially in the month of June, he destroyed the month of June. But overall, for these two months, 290 batting average, 363 on base, 565 slugging. I think you'd be surprised to know that he had a better OPS plus and a better WRC plus during this period than Matt McClain did. Jake Fraley's bat was so instrumental during this streak of winning. And I think that it's easy to kind of overlook him because he wasn't a rookie. He wasn't a call up. He was a rotational guy that only hits righties and things like that, but he murdered righties. In fact, he hit more home runs than anyone on the team during these two months. He led the team. He had 10 homers during these two months of the season. And I think that as the season went along and, and, and he, you know, broke the toe, I forget, was it like the fourth toe on his left foot or something like that, something like but that. he had the fractured toe that he missed time with. And then he had to play, play through the pain because basically he has to get surgery and see either you have surgery in your after the year, or you come back and you play hurt, then you get surgery which to his credit, he played through the pain. But the reason that the Reds lineup missed him so much is because of the damage that he did during this period. Yeah, his his June numbers were absolutely ridiculous. And I know you combined them there, June and July. But if you look at his June, his slash line was 346, 414, 712. That all works out to a nice OPS of 1.125, which was tops on the team for the month of June. He was phenomenal. Six home runs in that month, 15 RBIs. For good measure, he got five walks and stole five bases. He was just a nightmare for opposing pitchers in the month of June. And, and that's the same month that Will be Benson blew up. You talked about that a little bit earlier in the mm -hmm. show. In that same period of time, he slashed 350, 473, 600 with an OPS of 1.073. Those two guys together were just absolute beasts driving this offense during a time when, when the rookies were putting it together. And I think what that allowed for. I think that allowed some of the pressure to come off Ellie De La Cruz and some of the pressure yeah. to come off Matt McClain. And so if they had a game where it wasn't quite right, you know, these other guys were picking up the slack. Well, and everybody knew Ellie was going to run. You know who else ran? Jake Fraley. Jake Fraley actually had the second most steals during this time period as well. Like, I think that there's some value to Jake Fraley that people are overlooking. He is one of ever current, at least Reds fans on social media, um, one of their favorite players to be like, yeah, we could put him in a trade. We we could trade him away. We could move on from him. Like, let's not forget this dude was good. This isn't a guy that he just kind of, you know, puddled his way through the season. Like we're not talking about Kevin Newman here. We're talking about Jake Fraley. He was absolutely fantastic. But you know what, Steve? As much as I love Jake Fraley, there's a singular performance, one single game. And it's a game that produced a work of art the likes we've never seen this side of the Mississippi, <laughs> at least not in a long time. The Ricky Kircher game. And if you're watching on YouTube, you're looking at this beautiful pitch display and the spray and the spread chart and all this other stuff and where all of his pitches went. These pitches that according to the pitch or the, you know, the picture of the batter in each box and all that stuff, he had three pitches that went higher than the batter's head. He had two pitches that dug up some earth. This equal to save. It's absolutely amazing. And I look at this spray chart and all I can think about is that image of Kurt Casale just <laughs> working his butt off behind the plate to, to try and knock these baseballs down. Like the, like the, the dad trying to teach his young son how to throw a ball or young daughter how to throw a ball. And he's just trying, I don't want to go run over the fence and catch it. I'm just going to try and block this any way I possibly can. Kirk Casale had so many dives. I think that more than anything is what led to him being like, you know what? I'm hurt. <laughs> I think I'm going to be like a, you know, I'm going to be on the roster, but not in the roster. You and know honestly, what I mean? <laughs> that's probably the Kurt Casale highlight of the year. Like, you yeah. know, if we're, making, if we're making his tribute reel next season, that's, that's the one that's on there is him making all these catches. But before we get out of here today and, and, and get out of this segment, Jeff, there is one more unsung hero. Uh, you know, earlier in the show today, I talked about my next favorite red, but I don't think we can talk about June and July without giving one final shout out to my current 
favorite red. He's still a current red for a little bit more days. Uh, and that is Joseph Daniel Vado. Mm. The, the most craziest stat. And it's a statistic we don't talk about a lot because I don't think it's like super indicative of a lot of things, but it is indicative of extra base power. And that is isolated power, which you simply get from taking the guy's slugging percentage and subtracting his uh, uh, batting average, which the idea is this kind of is like what the batting average would be if you take out singles. Joey Votto had the second highest isolated power on the team. Everyone criticized the heck out of the batting average. What they didn't realize was every time he put a ball in play, it was going for extra bases. Uh, he was a beast between between him being able to put up a little bit of a power display there in his first couple months back and the fact that he was able to pretty much call his shot in yes. his first game back I th which I think you were at the ballpark for yep. that was you know, game. it yeah. was it was it was nice to see because of all of the noise that was being made when Joey Votto was about to be activated, gonna he's going to disrupt the team. He's going to break the chemistry. He's going to ruin it. And then he just comes on and puts on a little bit of a power show. It's like a glove. Yep. And, and you know, there wasn't a lot of highlights to, to shout out Joey Votto on during the 2023 season, but that little, that little power run that, that return to the big leagues. I'll take that. That was, that was an unsung moment for Joseph Daniel Votto. Yeah, it just felt like every other game he was coming up with a big homer in a big situation that was giving the Reds a lead or tying the game up. You know, this was this was at the height of the Rally Reds and things like this, and Joey Votto was a very key member of the Rally Reds in the way that he was able to not necessarily start the rallies, but really, you know, the rallies culminated usually in a big-time hit from Mr. Joseph Daniel Votto and a quick shout out as well, because I think a lot of people like to remember Jonathan India's season as a struggle. And, you know, I, I think individually he probably would have liked his season to be a little bit better, but this was a period of time where his batting average was 216, but he was second on the team in homers. He was second on the team in RBIs. And I know that we have, you know, since learned that RBIs aren't necessarily the best way to evaluate a hitter. But I think it's interesting to note that like Jonathan India still had a lot of value as a power hitter at this given point in time where a lot of people were trying to like make him some kind of like, I don't know, <laughs> like he was a problem or something. Not And not in terms of Will Benson is a problem, but like he was a problem for the Reds and he just wasn't. That's just wrong. No, and we're going to spend a lot more time talking about Jonathan India this offseason because, yeah. uh, you know, for some of it, that it upset you, but he may be the biggest trade piece that the Reds have heading into the winter meetings. So we are going to definitely spend some time talking about what he did well, what he didn't do well, and what we think his value is. But I think that's probably a good spot to go ahead and wrap it up for today. Jeff, that is going to do it for this edition of Locked on Reds. Thanks so much for making Locked on Reds your first listen. Every day is coming up tomorrow. We're going to look at the final third of the season where uh, there was some promise, but the Reds ultimately came up short we'll take a look at that and what uh they need to do to make sure that doesn't happen again heading into 2024 until then jeff tell the people what they can expect from me and you they can expect us to be all up to date on the rumors all up to date on the news the transactions the rumblings and the grumblings because we are going to be locked on reds every single day i can't wait for the fry box flash mob it's going to be great i don't know how this evolved this way i thought i was just dancing here